Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's One Million by One Million Strategy Roundtable for Entrepreneurs. One M by One M, as you know, is the first and only global virtual accelerator. We run it out of Silicon Valley with the mission of helping a million entrepreneurs reach a million dollars and beyond in annual revenue. Of course, that doesn't mean that we are trying to fund a million companies. We are huge supporters and proponents of bootstrapping. And uh, of course, we also have lots of entrepreneurs who are interested in raising money, have raised money, etc. The largest company in our portfolio has raised $150 million since they were in the program and uh, have been very successful. But we also have many, many, many entrepreneurs who are not raising money, so all that is fine. All of those strategies are perfectly fine within this community. And as long as you build a successful business with customers, revenues, and profits, everything is good. So this is our 383rd free mentoring roundtable. This has been going on since the fall of 2008. So coming up to 10 years, and um, you will have a recording of the session as you have recordings of every other session that we have done available on our YouTube channel, 1M1M Roundtables. If you are looking for learning material, um, listen to lots of these uh, roundtable recordings and you will get a lot out of it. Um, they are good learning material. And uh, if you are following us on Twitter, please, uh, I guess if you are following already, then you, you know, but if you're not following yet and you'd like to follow, uh, use hashtag 1M by 1M or hashtag, um, uh, sorry, at 1M by 1M or at Shromana. Those are our two handles. Hashtag 1M 1M is the hashtag for today's tweeting. So if you are live tweeting this show, use hashtag 1M 1M. Now, um, we are not quite ready for call-ins yet, but this is a roundtable, not a broadcast. So we do want you to participate as much as possible. So make a note of the numbers. I will put this slide back up again later on when we are ready for you to call in and participate. And uh, you can also use the public chat in, um, on your right panel throughout the show to participate, ask questions, uh, you know, offer your thoughts and so forth. We're starting today with a conversation with Rajiv Madhavan, founder and general partner of Clear Ventures. I have known Rajiv for a long time, and uh, we haven't talked in a bit, so there are new developments. I'm really looking forward to catching up with you, Rajiv. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Happy to be on the show, Srimana. Yes, it's been a long time since we chatted. Yes. So uh, tell us about Clear Ventures. What is the Agenda, what, um, you know, tell us about the firm, how big is it, what is the investing focus, what size investments are you making? So Clear Ventures, again, was formed in uh, 2016, July, is when we actually did our second closing. The first closing happened in October. We are a 121 million venture fund, uh, first uh, Clear One. And we focus mostly on B2B investments. Uh, I mean, though there is nothing that prevents us from doing it in any particular area. We are purely opportunistic and we are here to make money. I mean, there is no doubt whatsoever that's our goal uh, and mission. We're not into the belief that you, you go with a particular theme alone in terms of investments. And the reason is very simple. Things come in and out. There's no AI funds that have succeeded or this fund that will succeed because things just keep changing in the valley. And it's, it's that constant change and evolution of the valley that makes this a very great hotbed. We focus on early stage, meaning seed. Uh, and typically, given my and uh, my co-partners' experiences as, as entrepreneurs before uh, doing a fund, we focus on very, very early stage, uh, traditionally what people would uh, call angel uh, level seed. Uh, so we like to write one to four million checks all the way uh, low end could be in the 200K range of things. We can go up to four million in the first round, which we have done uh, in programs that require that kind of money. But we obviously, I mean, um, you know, I have gone through different experiences. My second company was more and more of a bootstrap experience than anything else, and some of it forced by the fact that Silicon Valley uh, VCs, 35 of them, turned me down. So I understand how entrepreneurs feel on that. 
And our goal is to work with, uh, and as much I can tell you, I mean, we I really love working with entrepreneurs, and our job is to make them successful and help them wherever we can, whether we are in the fund, uh, as as a fund in in the, in the company or not. So let's take a moment to actually highlight um, your entrepreneurial experience, just for context for our uh, for our audience here. Rajiv did one of the. Uh, you know, most successful EDA, electronic design automation companies in uh, in Silicon Valley, Magma Design Automation, and um, and built it to very substantial size from scratch. So, uh, Rajiv, is there um, are there some highlights that you want to point out there from your uh, journey, um, just to provide some context for this discussion? Yeah, so you know, I'm one of the lucky ones, I say, because I only worked a year and a half in a big company. The First one and a half years of my life at Bell Northern Research, and after that I did my first company, Logic Vision. So, being in startups where I, I have been the boss of myself in some form or shape, so it makes life um, uh, live in, in a different way. And Logic Vision uh, was my first company. It was a chip design IP company uh, for built-in soft test. Uh, it went public in 2001. Was formed in 91. Second company was Ambit Design Systems, which I consider as my toughest uh, company because, you know, pretty much we were going up against uh, Goliath synopsis against what they had. It was David was Goliath Extreme. Uh, they, you know, eight guys in a room versus, you know, 1,200 uh, people in an ipo company, and, and we sold the company for $280 million after the first year of success. So literally, literally three years. Um, the company was built into a big success in the fourth year we sold. And then I did Magma, uh, and again, Magma was at the right uh, place at the right time. We led the low-power revolution, as you probably all of you are are now using cell phones, and you know, 80 to 90% of cell phones designed up until about five years ago were designed using our chips, and after that using Synopsys of software, and some now from Cadence software. but. We ended up uh, dominating that space of designing low power um, in 98. When we started out, the timing couldn't have been perfect. Uh, we went out right after the economy and, and, and internet had uh, tanked, and we raised, uh, you know, literally a lot of money because it was there wasn't very many avenues. Even though the market was down, to see good companies and, and fund good companies, uh, there weren't a large amount of that. And in 2001, we did our IPO. So literally on the third year of forming the company, we went from zero to 13 million of revenue, 14 million of revenue. So that was a real uh, growth and growing literally at 2x to 3x of the numbers. We had a lot of issues subsequent to the IPO and you know, I mean, 11 years of running a public company uh, made me a lot grayer, wiser, older, <laughs> all aspects of things. Uh, and, you know, I mean, uh, there was a year where, in 2005, where our biggest competition used litigation as a tactic to control us, so we went through a massive litigation, um, a, a very terrible experience where we had an employee who did uh, uh, bring things in and so had to fight a good fight, um, which the team did, and so we went, uh, it was a very big roller coaster in the sense that we went up to $125 million in bookings and then tanked down to 70 and then went back up to 200 uh, million in bookings. So it's sort of like a roller coaster, spent two and a half years uh, defending the litigation and winning the litigation, but was not uh, you know, an easy ride during that two and a half years of, of life. That's when, that's when you realize as a founder, uh, you have to stand up and fight for the rest of the company. And you know, that's a very important portion of what, what uh, I had to do. Uh, even though every morning when you go to work, when you have that many lawyers, you don't enjoy it. Uh, you clearly feel really bad about it. <laughs> An aspect of uh, running a company that's not pleasurable at all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, coming back to uh, your Clear Ventures uh, journey, the current um, journey, let's double click down a little bit on what uh, stage are you looking for? When you say you're willing to put in very early stage, $200,000 um, of investment, what are you looking for in terms of validation? Are you looking for just concept, pre-revenue, little bit of revenue, um, you know, customer validation, but not yet revenue? What is comfortable for you? So, 
so comfort is is I mean we have done all the way where the concept is not fully fully baked. We have had people just sit here with us, uh, and uh, you know having done being an entrepreneur with a lot of contacts that we bring, we take them to some of the customers and you know refine the generic idea into a product. We have done investments at that stage. Uh, there are two companies who sat here uh, in our portfolio and three. In a 2012 one, I was doing my own angel investments, which uh, were at that stage where the concept was not fully clear. We knew there was an opportunity. For example, there was a company called Robin Systems. We knew there was an opportunity to do, and it actually took some you know, um, headwinds and some changes and pivoting to get there. But eventually, we got to the point of understanding that we need a generic uh, infrastructure environment using containers, in that particular case, for applications, so very deep, highly distributed applications, allowing them to run uh, at scale. That was what Robin Systems was. But the program was ill-defined. You know, we helped define it and go from there. We have two other companies in our portfolio where it was very early stage, and not yet announced, where it started out uh, from that. To all the way where you know some have uh, the ideas half baked or half coded in, uh, and they can show you some demos. In which case we go and talk to their existing customers. In the earlier concept phase, we can actually help uh, by taking them to customers. I have numerous amount of companies who have pitched to us, even if we have not invested in them. They ra appreciate the fact that we take them to real customers and spend time with them. And I almost act like a VP of sales helping them uh, sell because it's my job uh, if I'm taking them to customers to uh, help them sell, even though we may not have at that stage done, uh, done an investment. But it's trying to get that product definition right at the concept stage. We can start from that very early cradle stages. Okay. Um, there is no need for proof for us. Um, we will try to get that proof by working with you and coming to you with you to customers and helping understand what, uh, how to refine your product idea into something that, that works. Right. And, um, so very, very early stage. Okay. And uh, also double click down for us in terms of sectors. So you said B2B is the primary comfort zone. Within B2B, where are your, you know, primary relationships? You know, obviously you seem to have relationships where you bring people into customers and so forth. Where are those relationships? What are the unfair advantages that you uh, have in the fund? So clearly having run companies where, you know, most of the Fortune 500 have had to buy something or the other, you know, the, the, from one of our portfolio companies or one of the companies we have created, that's really where our customer experiences are. But having said that, being not shy, I don't mind calling 20 people and getting them to, uh, uh, you know, uh, visit and spend some time with with my portfolio or potential portfolio companies. So it's, it's generally that that is our comfort area of B2B, uh, where it could be banks, it could be in the financial sector and the healthcare sector customers. Uh, we can go and get to them or in the retail. I have a company in the retail space called Reflection where, you know, the customers were all sorts of retail uh, players mm -hmm. where we brought in a, a founder, um, uh, Steve Papa, who was the founder of Endeca who knew and had done a company in that space and brought him as a co-investor with us to build that, that uh, relationship, which, we, which I frankly lacked. So having him on board uh, gave me the kind of help to get to those, those uh, customers. So mm -hmm. it's a question of trying to figure out how to get there, and uh, each company uh, is different. What we look for is the entrepreneur's drive, entrepreneur's past experiences, and are they credible in the area in which they are claiming to be able to deliver the technology in? I mean, everything else, happy to work with them. So two derivative questions out of that. Uh, one yeah. is, are you doing cybersecurity? We have done um, some security companies. We have one company in cybersecurity, one company in file-based, uh, you know, protecting your, uh, your files and assets, uh, a company mm -hmm. called Vera Systems. So we have done that, but it's a it's a very tough area because it's gotten very niche uh, area where you know it's almost like plugging the dam uh, the the dike and making sure it's it's stable by finding the little holes in there, and uh, we are a little bit concerned about the valuation prospects of some of those very small hole plugging companies, 
-hmm. so we try to give them the advice, uh, but nonetheless, we do look at those companies uh, from time and to time. What is, what is your perspective on um, mid-market uh, enterprise companies, so B2B companies, not necessarily enterprise companies, because uh, in, in a lot of sectors, the mid-market is underserved, enterprise is overserved, including in cybersecurity, actually. So what, uh, how are you viewing mid-market? So we have done, for example, one of the mid-market companies we uh, serving that space is a company called Reflection. Mostly, most of the retail vendors that they do is mid-market, not the highest okay. end of the, of the customers. They're now scaling to the highest end of the customers, but they started out with mid-market. And the real delta of what I've seen and observed is in the mid-market, the number of players that are there to support your software is almost zero, or the expertise mm -hmm. within those mid-market companies. So you really need to make your software completely, uh, you know, uh, deployable by the least amount of human beings required. It's got to get completely automated. Uh, if you're providing software like the high-end Adobe software, et cetera, you just cannot uh, support and, 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 and defend that kind of customers. You really need to do that with, you know, uh, the least amount of resources. So we have done one or two companies. Obviously, the advice and the amount of work we need to do with the entrepreneurs is to see how quickly is it deployable, how quickly mm -hmm. can we actually get the customer up and running. And you almost have to make it idiot-proof in, in a very, you know, automatic and complete self-learned way of deployment. And, and a lot of founders do not think about that because their experience has been on the high end of the enterprise and they think that can scale to the mid-market. Very, very important to make it you know, that easy because you can't afford to build a business where, you, where a lot of touch points are there. And what about geography? What is your comfort zone? That is very local. Uh, we unfortunately like to be in Silicon Valley. When you're doing at the early stage that I mentioned to you, we need to talk to the founders. We are we will have to go up and down and meet with them quite okay. Uh, 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 you know, often sometimes they sit in our office. We are happy to go and spend time with them. So we are very geographically, you know, Silicon Valley centric. Uh, I mean, obviously they can have R and D facilities, et cetera, outside. But when we start, we really want to see companies in Silicon Valley. Okay, and. Um Let's do a few, um, you know, highlights of your portfolio and with, uh, with some context about, you know, when they came to you with what and what was the thought process that you applied to deciding to invest in them? Yeah, so let me start with, uh, you know, I mean, uh, me and my partner, Chris, we were thinking about the need for protecting file security, much like, you know, essentially, let me just give you a history of a company called Vera, which kind of came and presented to us, and we were the first investors in the company. They, uh, before they came to us, thematically, we had concluded that what Snapchat had done, for example, where kids could send pictures and it disappears in five minutes, why isn't there a capability for companies to have rules saying, I'm going to give you access for this document for two days, but I'm going to withdraw the rights, and you really don't get the whole document. It's always encrypted, and the document calls home, much like it does in Snapchat to just go poof. But can you actually do it with rules to actually control the our relationship is for two weeks? You can actually read it. So-and-so can read it, but you can't forward it outside your domain or outside within mm -hmm. your local control. So we went out and made uh, phone calls, and one of the entrepreneurs that, that uh, Chris knew, you know, was working on something similar, uh, was in the bowels of a, another, uh, you know, venture fund, sitting there as EIRs and beginning to work on this. And we went and actively campaigned them to get it going, and became the first investors. And this is a company called Vera, and they provide that level of document security at scale. Mm -hmm. uh, again, um, essentially think of it as Snapchat, but with rules applied at a document and at any file level, providing the security, whether the document be or the file be in any mm -hmm. uh, asset, be could be on, you know, PowerPoint uh, sitting on, on a Google Drive or PowerPoint that you send out an email, the document calls home, sees what your authentication levels and rights are based on that, gives you the ability to open the document, uh, print in certain cases, et cetera. So it is a classic case of the kind of uh, companies we have worked. Uh, we have a company in, 
in security that we funded again they had the makings of uh, what uh, you know, they wanted to do radio security i mean if you look at what is happening a lot of people are uh, stealing badging information etc using bluetooth uh, you know sensors and scanners how do you protect things that connect to via Bluetooth to your computer, and then the computer is connected via Wi-Fi into your internal network? So, uh, yeah. like your LTE phone, how do you not prevent the stealing of data through LTE? So all of that, and again, being able to deploy it in mid-market in that particular case is, is a phenomenal opportunity because uh, really that's where the crux of the problem is going to be. Very large companies are going to put boundaries and perimeters and put all sorts of control uh, mechanisms to try to control this, but this is a much easier way to control it than anybody has deployed. Again, came in with a rough idea, we had them sit in with us, mm -hmm. and uh, you know the company, I'm not taking their name because they're gonna be launching next month, and uh, you know it's a very interesting company that we have done. All the way to there is a consumer app company, which we are in the process of doing where early stage they have some prototypes. So we can have different uh, differences. Um, it's, we have lots of companies where, you know, it could be at different stages. I have a company called Robin Systems have done a huge contribution in application-defined infrastructure. What we mean by that is in the early days of, uh, you know, the VMware, for example, what they did is they made one computer look like 10 computers and essentially mm -hmm. allowed you to run 10, uh, you know, windows uh, on one computer. But today's problem has changed upside down when you take applications which are distributed, anything from Oracle, Hadoop, uh, SAP, HANA, etc. You need to make hundreds of computers look like one cluster. And if you're using, you know, siloed environment where you get one set of infrastructure, someone else gets one uh, set of infrastructure, then you're wasting a lot of compute uh, resources. If you try to use virtualization in that space, your performance goes down. Uh, the amount of SLA you can provide to your customer saying this is the performance you're getting to get. But the problem of addressing making one cluster uh, look like one computer, one, one environment, very quickly out of hundreds of resources, and at the same time have somebody else take the spare resources of it and run it, and be able to use thousands of machines at, at the random for hundreds of applications. And we're getting to that point where lots and lots of applications are being written. So how do you provide an infrastructure that gives you that? Uh, mm -hmm. it's, we think it's a, as big an opportunity as what Nutanix was. We funded the company. Uh, help them bring in a CEO. Uh, in mm -hmm. fact, somebody who used to run uh, half of Magma and was one of the main causes of uh, uh, being able to create Magma runs the company. And the key architect and the CTO came from uh, Veritas. And we were incidental in sort of marrying the two together uh, mm -hmm. and helping them meet and uh, uh, get to form the company. So it was a great story in that we not only help create the company, but we can help put the two people that were key uh, in subsequent releases to get the product out the door and get the customers now uh, in, 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 in the running. Uh, and they're on the hunt for some very big opportunity in that there's nothing that really addresses the efficiency of applications that run on hundreds of computers, be it on cloud or be it on-prem, and hundreds of applications running at the same time and providing certain levels of you know, SLA, certain level of performance for each of those applications. Excellent. So, um, reversing the question now, um, if you look at, let's say, the year 2017, yeah. what have you seen, what trends have you seen in your deal flow? So, how many, how many companies do you see in a year, for example, and how many do you invest in, and what has been the 2017 deal flows nuggets of uh, trends? So in 2017, my average was I've seen eight companies a week. I'm just going to give you, uh, you know, my stats, Chris, is around the same, but I've, I've seen eight companies a week. Um, that's eight times, uh, uh, you know, 52. That's around 400 companies that we have, we have seen, uh, uh, too. Of the 400, we, we invested in probably six, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, six companies. So that gives you the, the velocity. It's almost like, you know, one in 100, uh, slightly higher yeah. than that. Uh, but that's the, 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 the frequency. Again, one of the things that I believe very much in, Shermana, is giving them the feedback uh, 
uh, helping them, even if we are not the investor, uh, because I tend to believe that, you know, I mean, that advice and mentorship and having gone through, as I told you, my second company, Ambit, where 35 VCs rejected me. So I have a, uh, I have an empathy and I have really feel that that helping them is, is, is important over and beyond what I do as a venture capitalist. So what are the trends in there? And that's uh, 800 the trend, Obviously, last year beginning and last year was a year where AI is in everything, whether they have data or not. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a common <laughs> pitch item, right? Oh, it's, yeah, I do AI. I know, and, lemming's behavior. <laughs> yes, that's the lemon's behavior. And unfortunately, you know, I mean, the question in AI is, first of all, AI as a service is is, a, is never going to work. I mean, it's basically going to be. Uh, because you're going to get Amazon and everything uh, providing AI as a service. It's going to be the applications that AI uses and changes on its head, right? I mean, things that could be done by human beings do building models, human beings looking at data and making the decision, that they can be automated. Now, there are two challenges to it. The ch challenge number one is, can you get the data and can you own the data? For example, we had companies come to me in semiconductor saying I can do yield optimization via artificial intelligence. Do you really think that TSMC will give you the data? And some of these entrepreneurs who have never been in the space tell me, yeah, we're going to get it. I've been in that space. It, you won't get that. So you really need the ability to have the data that you need for doing AI. And sometimes that means you know, striking partnerships, relationship, and then the actual end business application that gives you more value is what is going to give you the benefit of using AI. So we have out of our 13 companies, about uh, nine of them use AI underneath them, but I would call seven of their uh, AI applications as more predictive learning rather than, you know, real deep artificial intelligence. Two of them are real deep AI. So last year was the year of artificial intelligence. There were like 11 chip companies that we saw even. I mean, very surprising to me. Um, and to all the way in different applications making claims that AI is going to be the be all and end all uh, solution for all. We did not uh, buy into the, that thesis. We think that AI will play a role in making an application change the way a current application has been written or done, but the end value is going to be in the vertical use of that AI in an application. So, you know, so that's one of the, the one of the theses that we kind of had during the last one year, looked at that. Uh, we saw a number of companies uh, focus with a, a series. A was getting a little tighter, seed was getting a lot easier because I think Silicon Valley has had a lot of success with angels and a lot of funds uh, in the 10, 20 million range, et cetera. So seed was getting very easy, and uh, Series A was getting tougher during the last last uh, year and Series B. So it's almost like there's a middle glut of money, and then at the tail end where, you know, Series D, E, F is lots of money. Lots of money. And seed has lots of money. So it was the way we were observing it. Uh, and and part of part of it is is people's uh, you know desire. Some people's desire. Some of the startups founders had extreme goals in terms of valuation, r raising the valuation unnecessarily. I mean, it's this whole unicorn impact that that drove them to to think that you got to increase your valuation arbitrarily, right? I mean, at, at the end of it, valuation in the early stage is not going to be the differentiation as much as the, I mean, this is from experience. I mean, it's, it's how you execute and get the amount of customers and win the customers. That will determine your final exit value and your final uh, IPO or whatever valuations you get at the end. And ridiculous valuations are not a favor because eventually to get the success for everybody, if you have investors in a business, you're going to get an ex you're going to need to get an exit. An exit is not going to be based on your last round valuation. Exit is going to be based on your traction. So you better not let the valuation run ahead of itself. Yeah, I mean it's actually very negative. People don't realize you do that, yeah, it's very and negative. then you're to go for a next round. And if it's going down, it actually is going to hurt you tremendously because there are rights. I mean, even in an IPO, right, there are rights that you've given to the last investors, which is at a higher valuation. You're in a terrible position if you're going with that, with that model, right? So you really need to think through that. 
and uh, you know, not worry. I mean, uh, about early stage valuation. I always tell us you have to you have to make sure that it's a win-win for you, for all the employees, and for all the investors. And a lot of uh, founders do not realize. I mean, they keep like seventy percent, sixty percent, etc. That's a. I mean, it is absolutely the kiss of death because you really want to give your entrepreneurs an opportunity, especially to make their first few, you know, big contribution value. If you do not do that, you're not going to be able to recruit in a Silicon Valley where you have, you know, the Googles, the Facebooks of the world, uh, giving up, uh, giving very high salaries. If you want to recruit great talent, and you better have talent which is better than you as a founder. That's a given. I, I think I was the dumbest guy in some sense in the early days of Magma. I had at one period where everybody in the team had a PhD except me. Uh, I mean, and, and I really loved the fact that that was the case. And I would love to encourage that, that hire people who are smarter than you. Well, there are different kinds of smarts and, and uh, people who are doing yeah. electronic design automation software, having good, you know, solid electrical engineering credentials is very helpful. Yeah, I mean, but that's that's true in AI. That's true in every one yeah, of the no, areas. I mean, right? I, I mean, that is a proxy. <laughs> yeah, that is a proxy. So, and the funny thing is, is you know, if you don't give them the right amount of options yeah. uh, and right yeah. amount of because you can't pay them, overpay them, and there are founders who are coming in uh, thinking that we're going to take a large amount of money and we're going to pay them like we are paying at, uh, we were paying at Google or we were paying at uh, Facebook, etc. You need to understand that's not what you got to get a person coming into your company excited about. You got to get them excited about the stock. The moment you've done that, they are bought into the company, and everyone works towards the same goal of success of the company, and not, you know, just my salary. Yeah, yeah. And uh, at the point that you made about seed capital uh, being abundant and seed fundings being abundant, and then the Series A gap. Uh, becoming an issue is is huge because uh, I think the numbers are like 50,000 to 70,000 or even more seed financing a year. Uh, the, I don't think we have the 2017 numbers yet, but uh, but those have been the numbers for the last four three years, 2013 onwards. And uh, Series A, B, I mean the venture number is only about 1,200 to 1,500. So yes, there is a huge drop off that's happening, um, and and we don't really have a great answer um, on how to cross that gap, you know, whether it's a quality attraction gap or whatever, but you need to have show certain levels of validation. Big today, the Series A guys are looking for a lot of different metrics and a lot of different uh, validation metrics, traction metrics, velocity metrics, which uh, are not, not necessarily being tackled by the uh, companies who, are, who have raised just seed money. So it's 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 been a very tricky environment, and as you point out, there are 500 to 600 uh, micro VCs in the market right now who are uh, funding tons and tons and tons of uh, companies at the seed stage. It, the game has changed. Seed used to be the harder round to get, and now the game has changed. Seed is because there's a lot of money slushing around in seed. Yeah, yeah, there's a, uh, too much money in seed and. Uh, uh, I mean, a lot of people uh, think that they can write 50K checks and 500K. One of the things I'm mighty proud and my partner Chris is mighty proud about is we have done in our history about 65 to 70 companies. This includes all the angel investments I did uh, since Ambit in 98 uh, on to the investments that Chris had done at USVP and Sequoia. Out of the six seventy companies that close to seventy companies we've done, all of them have gone on to raise Series A and B, and that applies even today. Right. So we we take great pride uh, in picking companies where we think there's a you know very good uh, rate of closing Series A and Series B, and we spend a lot of time with the companies to making sure that those metrics are thought about right from day one, and even if the metrics are not sky high, set your metrics clearly and deliver to those metrics, and that's the, that's the challenge, right? And your valuation may be low if your metrics were only, you know, X, Y, C, but it's better to get that rather than not have any clear, uh, you know, metrics that you want to succeed towards and uh, showing the new investors that, look, this is my goal. I have continuously hit my goals, and I will continuously hit the next milestone goal. Um, yeah. So that, that confidence is what you need to show. 
and that's you know the challenge. A lot of the early stage people do not have uh, not run companies like in a public company where you have to hit the numbers or whatever the metrics are. And nowadays, if you do the seed uh, investments, you need to think about it at that stage. Yeah. So last question: um, What is your TAM preference? And and I'll tell you where I'm coming from. You know, we are in 2018 January. There is a lot of stuff that has been built already, and and there aren't, as you said earlier, in the context of cybersecurity, there are a lot of niche opportunities, but there aren't as many or as abundant multi-billion dollar opportunities lying around. So I, you know, I talk to a lot of investors and. Um, including a lot of these micro VCs. Uh, everybody says, or not everybody, but a lot of people say they want to do an unicorn valuation, so that means they want billion dollar market, multi-billion dollar market opportunities and so forth. And I'm um, constantly wondering, it's like, wait a minute, there are 200, 300 million TAM opportunities, in some cases maybe 100 million dollar TAM opportunities, where if you build a robust company with very big market share, you become like the dominant player in a niche that has a smaller TAM, that is also an opportunity for making a lot of money. Are these opportunities that you would consider or are these not part of your no, again, again, while we may look at some of them on a case-by-case -case basis, the chances are low because I believe that the number one thing that helps a, an entrepreneur is the wind behind them in terms of the size of the market. If the market is big, the, uh, your execution can have one or two hiccups and you will still succeed. If the market is small, the chances of that is very low because you got a one path and you got a one path of execution. So obviously, market is almost as important, if not more important sometimes, than the team. I mean, I have seen. I actually agree with that. There's there's different points of views in Silicon Valley on that topic. I agree with you. I think market is more yeah. important than. So to me, number one is market. Number two is is team. Obviously, both you know, it's a very tight call between the two very of them. Important but both of that, them. It's where both of them is important. Everything else is is sort of immaterial, and that's what we we when I told you we take it at very early stage. When we are trying to refine the product development, we are looking at the TAM and we are saying, okay, this portion is better, uh, found, uh, founder XYZ. We let's go and do that. Your technology is great for that. And it's important to realize that it's uh, the market makes a lot of difference. And a hundred million dollar market, et cetera, is very, very difficult to build a company on because you make two execution mistakes and you're fried. And what ends up happening is if the technology is not complex. Actually, I mean, it has to be complex enough that it's not easy for 10 guys sitting in some other place, not having the expertise in Silicon Valley, but can compete against you right away. Uh, you need to have that one or two years of delta and the gap that you can put. Uh, if you can't, it becomes very, very difficult, especially in enterprise companies. In consumer, obviously, being able to capture eyeballs and capture customers and how fast can you move does make a lot of difference. And sometimes you don't need that, uh, what I just said. But there you need a lot more capital than what people have thought because if you look at all the companies which have built marketplaces, they have had to take a lot of money. But even there, the metric still requires you to kind of get down to a certain set of number of users and make sure that you're tracking that, right? Uh, so it's very, very important to have market behind us. So in our particular case, we look for the total available market as almost the number one priority. We work with the founders to help you define that, as well as sometimes help you saying, maybe this technology is better used for that. Let's go move to, do, to doing that mm -hmm. uh, in the very early stage. It's very, very important to me. All right. Well, excellent conversation, Rajiv. I know you have a meeting. and. Uh... We're going to start the mentoring portion of the program. Thank you for coming, and we'll keep in touch, and I'll send you some things to look at soon. Thank you, Sermon, and thanks very much. Bye. 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 Folks, um, we are going to do the entrepreneur pitch session next. Let me set some expectations here. Remember, this is a working session, and we are on your side, so you can feel completely safe. We have no other agenda whatsoever other than helping you move forward with your uh, businesses. It is possible that you might disagree with my feedback. That's okay. It's your venture. You will make the decisions. 
just listen, take the input, process the input, uh, you know, listen to the recordings, maybe process the input and see what you want to do with what input you're getting here. Um, remember, not all businesses can raise money and not all businesses should raise money. Some businesses do not have the characteristics of a venture style startup, but still can be a successful venture. You can still build, you know, customers, revenues and profits and that's fine. And raising money also doesn't guarantee success necessarily. So we're going to go to Pavan Nandan. Um, Pavan, please uh, unmute your line and tell us what you're doing. Pavan is dialing from Hyderabad, India. Greetings. Uh, uh, my name is Pavan Nandan, and uh, I've developed Creep Beep. Creep Beep is an anti-creep app. And um, basically, creep beep, it can only be used by women. And we figured that out by using Facebook login authentication. And mm -hmm. that is the whole point of the app is to uh, provide a consistency of ratings so that the user can view those ratings and then decide which place to move on to, which place to go to. We uh, initially developed a prototype, which is currently available on the App Store. We also have mm -hmm. a website uh, which uh, defines and which talks about what our app is about and what our vision mm -hmm. is about. So that, uh, so that is what uh, we are here to do here. Next slide, please. Yeah, Our uh, target user uh, is basically users who are in transition, who move from rural to urban spaces, or from a different space, they move to a new place. And our, uh, obviously, as this is a gender-segmented app, our target users, again, are uh, urban women at the age of 18 to 40, and who are also heavy users of social media and who who check in, who are like, who do regular check-ins, went to the places they visit. And uh, that is our target user. And the problem here we are uh, looking at is uh, our uh, target segment does not have an avenue to know how secure the place is. And uh, this is primarily because uh, the existing apps uh, do deal with uh, subjective elements. However, uh, but they do not capture, I mean, they only capture ambience, food, or star behavior. However, they do not capture something which is emotional. Uh, this is especially relevant to places that attract a lot of young crowd and are open around the clock. Um, and our solution is very simple. You want to develop a mobile application that allows consumers to rate a particular place. They wish it solely on their behaviors, uh, solely on the behaviors they observe. And uh, for example, the app will ask the user if the staff help them select through their menu proactively and not ask whether they like the variety presented in their menu. It is not about the menu, but how the consumer is made to feel about the menu that defines the experience for the consumer. Our app is pushing the boundary in feedback generation by moving away from the presenting objective standards to subjective experience of consumers. We want our consumers to feel at home, home in any place they visit by using our app. Uh, so in, the, in terms of customer acquisition, uh, our first priority is obviously to build awareness around the app, uh, we, which we have already started. We have a Facebook page, uh, which we are active on. We do interact with a lot of, uh, lot of people because we haven't launched, launched the app live. We interact in terms of uh, if there's an app, something like this, would there be a lot of usage? And we do get a lot of feedback and uh, we take that feedback down to in, in the, incorporate that into the app. Uh, the main uh, marketing strategy would be uh, app store mo monitor, uh, optimization and mobile marketing. And uh, during the initial days of the launch, that would be very essential for uh, growing the app and uh, gaining a lot of traction. And also customer retention is also very useful. Uh, most of the apps are uh, deleted immediately from a phone in the period of seven days. Uh, hence, we do have a lot of uh, features in, in the app, which we have, which we'll be designing, which is, uh, which has engagement and rating prompts, which will also drive our customer retention really high. Next slide, please. Um, as, as I said before, we are just a prototype, hence, uh, we are the app was only built to convey the idea or the intent of the app to take in a lot of feedback and to consider that feedback and to incorporate into the app and to see how the users are reacting however we ran a small campaign on a facebook page uh, we spent around 62 dollars which is not a lot uh, but uh, the campaign received around 30000 impressions and uh, that is uh, 2 that $2 did you get any downloads uh, this is a prototype app, uh, so the, all downloads which happened were uh, done on sole purpose of feedback. I mean, we went to people and asked them to download the app, people who I know personally, to take feedback from them. Uh, this is I the see. app which is currently presented on the app store. So, so there is no validation as yes. such. You know, 30,000 impre impressions doesn't really validate anything. What's, I mean, unless there is actual engagement with customers, there's no validation. 
Um, yes, uh, if, if that is uh, the case, then true. Uh, then there isn't any validation as such. Uh, but uh, it is it is a prototype uh, that is what we build because we build the prototype in a very uh, financially in a frugal way. We spent only three hundred dollars. I am not a guy from tech, but uh, I developed it to a freelancer. So we build the app uh, in a very basic. Pavan, way. Pavan, are you uh, are you doing this full time or do you have a job? Uh, I left my job three months ago to concentrate on this. Uh, I've started. Uh, I'm I'm working on this for the past three months. So um, I see your ask. You're looking for funding to develop these app, this app. I can tell you, nobody will give you funding to develop the app, which is why I asked you the question: Do you still have a job or not? I, I would recommend that you get yourself a job and do this as a bootstrapping with a paycheck. Apps like this are perfect for a bootstrapping with a paycheck kind of model, where you're bootstrapping. You you have a day job. You're doing things. Um, you know. Systematically, you have cash to you're not, you're not cash trapped, and you do this on the mm -hmm. side because there is absolutely no chance of raising any financing for this at this stage. I'm not okay. saying it's not a good idea, but there's so little validation and so little done at this point. Apps only get financing after you've shown significant traction, and here you haven't even okay. completed the app, so there's no chance of this getting funded. Okay. Um um, can you give me some kind of feedback regarding the app in terms of uh, what we are trying to do? As, uh, um, as what we're yeah. trying to do is all very well. How you're going to monetize it is the real question. Businesses are built not on usage but on monetization. And, and the reason you're going to need to pay huge attention to that right now is, you know, very often people like in your shoes often come back and tell me that we're going to monetize by advertising. Well, Advertising monetizes very poorly. If you look at um, an article that I wrote recently, go to the website, go to the blog, 1M1M one &one blog, and see this article called Why Does the Indian Market Continue to Disapp uh, Disappoint? It's under um, opinions. You will see mm -hmm. what I talk about. One of the numbers that I talk about is that Facebook, with 240 million users, has only $50 million of revenue in India. Okay. Now, that is a very, very poor monetization number. If you extrapolate from the, their monetization number and their CPMs, their you know, ad rates are the highest in the industry because they have identity. They really True. can provide an incredible degree of precision in whom you're targeting. So in your case, it's going to be unbelievably tricky to do this with with um, advertising. So the question is, is there any chance that you can get people to actually pay for your app? And if there, I have my doubts because in India people don't pay to, you know, download apps and use apps very much either. And, and nowhere in the world they do very much. There are a few things, there are a few categories where there we see a bit of paid app um, usage, but very little. So I right. think the chances, the, the big gaping question in my mind in your business is monetization. And until you have a compelling mm -hmm. answer for that, um, I would recommend that go get a job. Don't spend your time full time on this business. Okay. Okay? Yeah, th yeah thank you. All right. We have Paul Colkitt as the next uh, presenter. Paul? Are you there, Paul? I see Paul in the panel. Okay, let me go. Yeah, there we go. Go ahead. Okay. Hi, my name is Paul Colquitt. Um, I'm the founder of the Nuclear Network. Um, if you could, next slide. Um, okay. To clearly and accurately express the functions and specifics uh, pertinent, I'd like to introduce and use some innovative terminology that might better serve to explain, illustrate, and define the custom applications, metrics, and scopes of activity that is applicable herein with the solution. Let's use the language and approach or style as a simple and informal way to communicate effectively and cover generalized concepts in a more efficient and timely manner. 
Sometimes or at times, it requires a refreshed approach and outlook on recurring conditions or problems that are resolvable or mendable, improved and reprised for greater throughput, diligence, and effectiveness and resolution. This company will be capable of such since the dynamic structuring of it transcends the multiple frontiers of capacity according to each premise addressed and focused through professional disciplines and the applications of advanced developments in each area, region, and occasion. The results of all activities should prove beneficial to all parties, entities, and industries in a non-competitive but developmental manner. Uh, if you could, the uh, next slide. Streamlining unlimited values by sustainable, cost-effective, and subsequently cost-free premium to consumers by leveraging the network capacities to culminate and fulfill Paul? all goals and objectives. Paul? Mm -hmm. sure. I would like you to stop for a moment. So far, okay. you've spent already over a minute I have understood absolutely nothing. So let's, okay. and your, your slides are absolutely unreadable and unusable in this kind of a format. Slides have to have only okay. a very few, um, you know, words of text on each slide to really be able to be useful. And you have all this like, you know, paragraphs and paragraphs of stuff and that's well, not helpful. Might, might, so I, might I consolidate the information then and, and summarize it maybe in a more no, simplified No, no, I, I don't. I'm going to ask you questions and I would like you to answer those questions and I think that will be a more sure. productive way of our uh, getting somewhere with this. Who is your customer? Okay. And you define very precisely who is your target customer. Um, underemployed, underutilized professionals, and the unemployed. Unemployed and underemployed professionals in any particular well, sector or just generically underemployed professionals? Maybe to better explain this, uh, the network is just a professional network of professionals and scholars that cohesively work together to achieve common goals and, and initiatives. We meet on a weekly basis through seminars and meetings. So and through this you are trying to do you're trying to do a net professional network and come content company like LinkedIn, but for a specific segment of unemployed and underemployed professionals, is that what you're saying? No, well, that would, that would more so serve as the target consumer who would benefit the most, but the independent business owner would benefit just as much as an unemployed person in this, in this capacity, in this, in this setting. And what is the pain that you're solving? of your customer, target customer? Uh, their economic conditions that they're in. Uh, currently, especially in my demographic, there isn't a uh, more sophisticated approach and intelligent manner to fulfill needs of unemployment or uh, gaps in industry. And we serve to not work as a union, but as a professional network that uh, has features that uh, inform each member and peripheral uh, participant with everything active, dynamic, and ongoing with the day to days or uh, each quarter's uh, market needs and demands, area specific. So it's some sort of a community forum where people come to as a business network? Um, to, to more simply put it, as a network, when you join and you pay your premium, you're entitled to um, uh, core services which is listed in the previous slide, uh, two slides prior. By uh, engaging with an agent that you're assigned by being a member, whether you're um, the slide, one more slide, uh, by being a member, you are actively able to um, benefit from those um, core services. And in doing so, um, the agent will link you with the according um, principle that is able to fulfill your needs. It's this slide previously, I, I apologize. Here at the bottom so, of the uh, so I, I'm going to send you back to the drawing board to do a much better pitch because this this pitch is not okay. we can't really work with this pitch. This is really really low quality pitch, and you really need to learn how to do a, a higher quality pitch. Um, yes, so there are instructions in our um, in our uh, forum. There are numerous recordings. If you go to our YouTube channel and listen to a bunch of recordings of pitches, other people who have pitched, you will learn how to pitch, maybe listen to 10 recordings of prior roundtables okay. and really get a feel for how to pitch a company, okay? All right. All right, well, 
So, um, folks, if you like what we are doing here, and as you can see, the feedback is absolutely un uh, sugar coated. Uh, if you if we think that your company is not fundable, we'll tell you that. If we think your company is not your business idea is not monetizable, we'll tell you that. If we think your presentation needs work, we'll tell you that. But you have to have appetite for that kind of direct feedback. And if you do have the appetite, that's when you actually learn from this forum. So if you like this strategy, if you like this you know dynamic of this uh, you know this community, please bring serious entrepreneurs into 1M by 1M. Um, all our resources are at 1M by 1M.com. You'll find a blog that is chock full of interesting information. The Entrepreneur Journeys book series is also a great learning material. There are 12 volumes of those books. And, um, and if you are, you know, if you have doubts, by the way, about bootstrapping with a paycheck, go read the bootstrapping with a paycheck, for example. There are lots of very serious, very successful companies be, that have been built using bootstrapping with a paycheck as the primary methodology to bootstrap to validation. And I'm, we have no problems at all with that. Most accelerators do not support bootstrapping with a paycheck. We do. Um, all the rest of the uh, books, each of them double click down on specific topics and, um, and you will find lots of you know, depth in each of those topics through those books. So that's a good learning starting point for your learning as well. These roundtables happen every week, um, so keep an eye on the free roundtable, free public roundtable page for the schedule and you can register. Our full acceleration program is 1M by 1M premium. And through that you will learn extensive methodology. We have a great curriculum that's an online curriculum, video lectures and case study based. We help you with business development, strategy consulting. We have these kinds of roundtables, members only private roundtables every week as well. And we help you with financing and media relations. Um, go to the 1M by 1M self-assessment on the 1M by 1M blog. It's, this is available for free and ask these questions of your business. It's a very good way to see where you are in your strategic planning, how robust is your strategic plan. If you're getting stuck in terms of methodology on how to do this and how to do positioning and how to do a bottom-up market analysis, market sizing, et cetera, go do one and by one in basics. That's a curriculum only option. You can, you know, rapidly, we have more than 400 hours worth of curriculum, but you can rapidly run through, um, you know, uh, let's say 50 hours worth, worth of core curriculum and plug a lot of your methodology gaps. And it's very worthwhile doing that. So that's pretty much it. Go to the website, look around, see if this is the right program for you. It may not be the right program for you, by the way. Only people who can work with a lot of self-learning, with the motivation for a lot of self-learning, the discipline, and, and the rigor of self-learning can be successful in the one million by one million program. And my thesis is that entrepreneurs can only be successful if they have that rigor and that dynamic of rigorous self-learning. So there are lots of FAQs, video FAQs about the program, description of the curriculum. You'll find all the entire curriculum is based on case studies and you know, interactions with hundreds and hundreds of successful entrepreneurs. I think we have more than 800 successful in, uh, entrepreneurs, about a hundred or so investors who have part help, participated in helping us build this platform for you to learn from. Our methodology is lean capital efficient bootstrap startups. Even if you raise money, you're going to most likely have to raise, uh, have to bootstrap first and then you will have the chance to raise money. So that's pretty much it. We have free roundtables every week in February. And we also have in-person rendezvous every week, um, every Wednesday actually. At, we are meeting at uh, 5 p.m. Pacific at Cafe Boroni in Menlo Park. Um, so go to the website and register for website and register for any of these um, gatherings, whatever suits you, and you can come to multiple. Um, we are very approachable, very available, and very accessible as far as uh, getting help is concerned. So that's it. Uh, line is open right now for Q and A, open Q and A, and also the public chat is open for uh, public Q and A. Q &A. 
You can ask any amount of questions in either format. You can introduce yourself, tell us who you are, where you're dialing from, what you're working on, so we can get to know you and you can get to know one another. So it is a networking session now as well. So um, I see a few questions. Let me start taking some questions here. Um, Amarish is asking greetings. This was a wonderful session. Where do I send my pitch for feedback? Uh, you're going to have to sign up to pitch at a free public roundtable. So go um, go to that page uh, on the public website and uh, register to pitch. And Maureen will send you instructions on how, what what will follow. Vinayak Rago, you're sending me private messages. Don't send me private messages. Here we go. He's got also sent it in public. I'm attending after considerable time. During starting days of 1M by 1M, I had browsed the series. I has come up very well. Love the concept, and thank you for your effort and congrats on taking it forward. Thank you, Vinayak. I appreciate that. Thank you for coming back and stopping by. Paul Kokit, is there anyone who would take time to learn my company and its offering unique composition and potential for startup support partnerships? So that's uh, he's asking this question to the audience. If any of you are interested in corresponding with Paul, please feel free to let him know your uh, preferred communication mode. Anybody else here? Um, I want to address someone in the audience who sent me a private message um, overnight, Chirag Sangavi, you sent me an, a message asking for guidance. Um, so if you already have an idea, you're welcome to come and pitch at one of the public roundtables, one of the upcoming sessions. If you're looking for methodology guidance, my suggestion to you would be to go start uh, studying with 1M by 1M basic. So start doing the curriculum and start getting that methodology under your belt and through that process, you will ha you will be able to find an idea to work on as well. Um, but if you so if you're still looking for an idea, that may be the better route to go off. And if you're still looking for an idea, the best way we recommend is to go start immersing yourself in the curriculum. We have 400 hours plus of curriculum, both core curriculum as well as industry-specific elective modules, and and hundreds and hundreds of case studies and trend analysis. So you immerse in that material, you will come up with uh, ideas, that we believe. Any other questions? Elizabeth Brady, are the Wednesday in-person meetings only for pitching or also for advice on taking an idea to the next step? No, those are not for pitching at all. Those are pure, you know, free-flowing conversations. So you can come and ask any questions you like. We don't have any formal pitches. We don't have any formal speeches. It's completely informal, just chatting. Anybody else? Any other questions, comments, issues that you want to discuss? While you're thinking about that, let me introduce you to Irina Patterson. Um, Irina's email is irina at 1m1m.com. Feel free to email her if you have questions about the program. And again, open Q&A right now. Other questions, comments? No? Would you like to introduce yourself? Anybody in the room, if you would like to just introduce yourself, that's fine too. We'd, uh, we love to get to know people who are coming to these sessions. It's a great opportunity for networking also. Are there any questions from the group that is assembled in Miami at the WeWork uh, location where I know we are doing a meetup with you? 
with WeWork. You're also welcome to introduce yourselves. All right, folks, if nobody has questions, comments, feedback, introductions, then we're going to wrap up the session and we will meet you back here next week. Or maybe we'll meet you at the in-person session in uh, Menlo Park in Silicon Valley next week. Talk to you soon. Have a very productive week in the meantime. Uh, Marish is asking, do you also help connect to the right VC post a good pitch? Amrish, um, if you want to be introduced to anybody, whether it's VC or, in the, uh, or customers, potential channel partners, etc., you need to be in the premium program and you need to be fundable. We're going to work with you to get you there, but uh, we don't introduce anybody unless you're in the premium program and unless you have worked with us to get to a stage where, by our judgment, you, your project looks fundable. So it's not a it's not an automatic introduction at all. If you have further questions, Amrish, on how the program works, you're welcome to contact Irina and she'll be happy to help you. Folks, I'm about to adjourn the session, so if you have any other questions before I do that, please speak up. So one more time, Irina's email is irina at 1mby1m.com. Any of you can contact her, and she will be very patient and very happy to help you answer any questions that you need to be answered. All right, folks, we'll see you soon. Good luck with everything. Bye-bye.